Another big concern. So definitely the overconfidence, specifically in younger men, the under participation in stocks, the hurting effect, the recency bias as well, which also persists in the market. Uh oh, we're now pessimistic about the future. Oh my gosh, I don't have life insurance. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko. And on today's episode, I am joined by Colin Slabach. Colin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited for today's conversation. We have a lot of great topics to cover in behavioral finance and how that impacts markets, investors' decisions. But before we jump into all of that, for our listeners who aren't familiar with you yet, can you talk a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure. So originally, I'm from Illinois, where I grew up in corn and soybean country. We had bring your tractor to school day. And from there, I went to Lakeland College, then Eastern Illinois University, and I got my PhD and master's at Texas Tech in personal financial planning. And then I went to go work at the American College for Financial Services, helping run the Retirement Income Certified Professional, the RICP. And then more recently, about six months ago, I moved to New York City, which is very much different than where I'm from. And I'm now currently running the Master's in Financial Planning program at NYU. So you are well qualified to talk about the topics that we're going to cover today. And the first one that I want to cover with you is behavioral finance, because I know this is something that you really like researching. And so to just kind of frame the conversation today, can you explain what behavioral finance is and how it's different from mainstream traditional financial theory? So it really boils down to, well, let me, let me take a step back. It, it starts with utility theory, which is this absolute beautiful model from an academic researcher standpoint, because there's really only four assumptions. And the first one is that you can rank goods. So if you have an apple or an orange, I like apples over oranges, but then if you put a banana in there, I can pick the banana or the apple or the orange, I would pick the banana. So I can rank goods, very basic assumption. People can choose the preference of their goods and then more goods are better. So you want more options, definitely want more options. And then there's a mix of goods. So you want more choices of those goods. And then the, the preferences are consistent at the specific point in time. So you, you have uh, consistent preferences. And this is the only four basic assumptions of utility theory. And it really creates these amazing different models that we can do with supply and demand curve and, and all these other various aspects. And um, when I say utility theory, I'm just talking about life satisfaction or the things that are driving your life satisfaction. But behavioral finance really came about because a couple of psychologists said these are not actually completely accurate. And part of the reason is, is we actually have a two selves. We, we have two selves. The, the first one is very much kind of a people pleaser, immediate jump to conclusion type self with a lot of energy. And then our other self is more long term thinking. And that's really where the difference comes around is willpower. Um, and then just various other factors like cognitive overload and really it violates those assumptions and that's where behavioral finances come about and we're just applying these various failures to to different aspects of say the market or personal finance I think it's really interesting because the more I learned about behavioral finance, the less I started to believe that markets are truly efficient because growing up in with economic background and then doing my CFA, I was kind of a boglehead coming out of it. I believed in market efficiency. But then when you start to learn about the way that the behavioral aspects can like impact markets, it really changed my views and kind of my thinking behind it. And so I guess I'm going to ask you how behavioral finance impacts markets and investors' decisions. Yeah, definitely. I think we see this screaming, I would say perhaps market inefficiency with FTX. It's like, well, now we're at hindsight bias where, oh man, now that we look back, it's like, oh, there was a lot of issues there. How the heck were they able to raise all of that money? cause all of these issues. And 
really there wasn't a lot of things in place behind that. Well, if you look back, it's like 1602 in Amsterdam when the first stock market came about. It only took like three or four years until there was a market bubble. And if you look on the surface, we can all kind of laugh at them and say, oh, it was tulip bulbs. It was just, it was tulip bulbs. But then you fast forward today and I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, we bet on cryptocurrency and these various other aspects. And I'm not saying that there isn't a, a use for cryptocurrency and there's definitely a use for the blockchain, but it's like, okay, guys, are we really that different? And it really boils down to our, our human behavior and our biology. Um, and so I would say markets may be efficient in some aspects that a lot of consumers won't be able to take advantage of the anomalies. But someone who really dedicates a tremendous amount of time can perhaps take advantage of these market anomalies. Now, that's not to say there's other factors that a consumer could not do to improve their returns outside of just being a passive investor. But yeah, it's, it's very difficult to take advantage of these anomalies, even though we do most know most of them exist. Yeah, I want to back up a little bit. And can you talk about what are some of those major anomalies and that persist in markets and the behavioral reasons behind why they are there? Yeah, so one that has been kind of put on blast lately over the past 10, 15 years has been the, the small firm effect. So firms that are much smaller tend to outperform. Now, there's kind of, well, they should outperform because they're riskier, they're more volatile. But then even if you adjust for all of those different factors, it seems like they do provide outperformance. One of the, the things that, that comes to mind is Peter Lynch, the, the Magellan Fund. He was primarily investing in these small cap funds. Now, he did take a little bit more of an active investor type approach. Uh, with investing in these, but it's kind of been put on blast as of late because the, the mega cap has performed so well over the past, I guess we would say the 10, 15 year range versus the small cap firms have, have not performed at that level. But it's, it's interesting because you would also say now that the rise of venture capital and private equity, we're seeing firms who are tremendously successful. I call them the, the tech-ish firms. They don't necessarily have to be specifically all in tech, but like Airbnb, for example, it didn't go public until it was a, already a large cap at like $47 billion. So I think that's been one that's been put on blast, but I also think it perhaps is gonna come back quite a bit. And really, I find it's just, perhaps low expectations, and it's a lot easier to go from being a $500 million company to a $1 billion company than to go from a $10 billion company to a $20 billion. Um, we've, we've tested that, and I think some screaming examples that are anomalies of that are Google, your Apples of the world, and they, they really have. They were able to double more efficiently and more effectively than small cap companies. But that's one of the anomalies. A second major anomaly is the January effect. So this has been a pretty persistent one for, for quite a while, where stocks who have underperformed throughout the year, specifically in the fourth quarter, tend to perform better in January. And the guy who came up with this was, was rather funny because he wrote this article I, I want to say hopefully he took advantage of it for multiple years because he did get superior rates of return if he did. And I, I personally would have not ever written the article and would have worked maybe in January and then gone on vacation to wherever for the, for the rest of the 11 months out of the year and just focused on, on the buying aspect of January. But he found that stocks that tend to underperform throughout the year, specifically in Q4, tend to do better in January. And this is because of the tax loss harvesting and rebalancing. And that's really where it, where it comes out. If you're a fund that rebalances in January or your tax loss harvesting, you're, you're gonna be selling in December, and you're gonna be repurchasing in January. And since the stock market in essence is the supply and demand, it's kind of been a persistent anomaly, but it's, it's shrunk a lot just since the article and it almost happened overnight. And that really boils down to game theory. If there's alpha to be obtained, 
we're going to continue to obtain that alpha in the market until it ceases to exist or becomes tremendously small. So that's kind of a, another major one. And there are institutional investors that are, are focused on that. So it kind of cuts out the, the little man, in essence, where if you're not, not really focused on that. A third one is momentum. So momentum, I would say, has been pretty consistent for quite a while. Momentum is more on the short term where news comes out, the stock either jumps to the upside or it jumps to the downside. And then it trends down afterwards if it dropped down or it trends upward after that. And part of that is believed to be the dissemination of information. So there are these high speed algorithmic traders who, who once the information has come out, immediately reacts. But then everyone else catches up to it. And I consider that to be kind of hard to, to take advantage of. And it's become a lot more muddled over, over multiple years. I would say an interesting one is when you have an AI or various aspects who are high-speed trading, they can misinterpret the information. And then there may be a huge opportunity of perhaps misinterpreting information. One of the ones that I, I saw recently was, uh, I believe it was Alibaba came out with their earnings and their earnings were way lower because they used equity method and a lot of their equity investments had dropped. And so the earnings looked really bad. And I think the algorithms saw that and then dropped the share price even more. And then it was like, oh wait guys, this wasn't as bad. That was their equity investments and it really came down to the um, having to, to, to sort that one out. But that's, again, getting more into high speed trading. And if you're just an average show investor, that's not something I would be partaking in. Those are the people who, who do perhaps day trade for a living, which I think is a lot harder than most people take into aspect. And if someone's trying to sell you a course on day trading or, or various other things, my guess is they're not as successful of a day trader as you, as you would think. Because if you're a very successful day trader, you're not going to be wasting your time creating a course in, in, in that essence. The, the fourth anomaly that I highly recommend perhaps looking into is more of the value securities. And this gets more at the behavioral aspect of the anomaly of overconfidence bias or we're too optimistic. And something you have a very low bar it's, it's nice to be able to just step over that low bar at low expectations. And so these are your kind of low PE stocks. Now, again, for the past 12 years, those have been rather underperforming versus your, your high swing, high value securities. I don't think that's because low value is dead or it's, it's gone away and we've become better at assessing the value of the securities. I just think with the interest rates dropping, a lot of, of cash flowing into the market, it really drove up the evaluations of other securities. I mean, we see like Netflix and Facebook have plummeted recently due to this kind of more resetting of the, the, the valuation as they were before. Five is reversals. I think the oil sector is the, the screaming example of a reversal. I think at one point they only made up about 2% of the S&P 500. Now I think they're up to five. And this is just a general trend of, you look at that market return quilt, and typically the ones who perform the best are not typically at the top again. And there's a lot of variation. So this is the reversal. So the ones who underperform are perhaps gonna perform better in the future. I think banks is another one. Oil and banks are the two big screaming sectors that I would say have experienced virtually perhaps no returns in the past five years and low returns over the past 10. And then you've got, um, I think China is another interesting one that has been absolutely abused. Their GDP has gone up a tremendous amount, whether you believe their factors and their numbers are exact or if it's way less. But yeah, over the past 15, 20 years, we haven't really seen virtually any appreciation in their market but the GDP has climbed up substantially. Now there's definitely additional risks associated with investing in China, but I think they're very well fit for a reversal. Six was, I just kind of put a fun one in, is uh, as we approach the Super Bowl, 
there was someone who I'm sure was a, a data mining aspect, but said that if the AFC wins, we'll enter a bear market. And if the NFC wins, we'll enter a bull market. And so that was kind of a funny one. In uh, 1978, it was discovered. And if you look back, 29 out of 43, or no, fast forwarding to today. So in 2022, 41 out of 55 times, this was actually correct. So we entered a, a, a the prediction of the AFC, NFC was, was actually correct. But it was discovered in 1978. And since it was discovered, uh, only 29 out of 43, so about 67% of the time it was, correct, it was correct. So just an interesting one. I, I always am very skeptical of these kind of data mining. You look, blast out a, a million different correlations and you'll definitely come back with one. Uh, one of them was, I think, a Turkish cheese sales. So the Turkish cheese sales were extremely correlated with the market. I think they had above a 0.9 correlation in predicting the stock market if the Turkish cheese sales were way up. Well, it really boiled down to someone went on a fishing expedition and then they finally found the fish that they wanted and um, it hasn't been persistent ever since. So this whole data mining aspect, um, I always like to compare it to if you flip a coin 10 times, the likelihood of it being heads is very low. But if you repeat that a million different times, you're probably going to couple that are going to be um, 10 and they're all going to be heads. So you've got to be careful with what people say when they, they say these various different things, because you can look historically, but it doesn't mean it's going to actually predict anything. It is so interesting. You mentioned so many great ones there. And it's interesting because even though they are widely known about and exploited by, you mentioned like a lot of big firms, and if it's a trading firm, they exploit these opportunities, but yet they still largely, most of them still largely persist into markets. And so although some premiums have dwindled over the years and they go through periods of underperformance, like small cap and value, but I guess I'm just wondering, while we know these exist, why do you think it is so hard for the average retail investor to kind of profit from some of these, even though we know about the January effect and the value and small cap effect? Why do you think it's still so hard? It's because there's people who are working 60, 70 hours a week who are really focused on this and they're making a lot of money. They've got advanced degrees. Not that I'm saying that that's necessarily an indicator but they're they're trying to exploit this and they're doing actually a pretty good job and the more that they're exploiting it the more efficient markets are becoming and if you have your nine to five job and even if you spend two hours a night afterwards what is the likelihood that you're going to be able to dedicate enough time i say there's you don't have to be specifically a completely passive investor you can be definitely a little more active Definitely perhaps considering the, the Schiller P ratio and looking at various other factors and tilting your portfolio. But when it comes to, to buying individual securities, you have to be aware that there are a lot of people who are working very hard and are already pricing these various things in. Doesn't mean that you can. It doesn't mean that you don't know more about something that the Wall Street may not perhaps hear or in say the pharmaceuticals industry and you know something more that's not insider trading but you know something more than than other individuals but i'd also caution that it's really i would say one of two sides you either want to be more looking at it full time and i would even say more than full time you're working 60 hours a week at it or you want to be the opposite and be leaning much more passive and focusing on other things like maximizing income being very efficient I think there's a lot of different opportunities in someone's personal life that they can increase a tremendous amount of efficiencies there and unlock perhaps higher earnings potential, uh, reducing their tax bills and various other things that I think would probably add more benefit to their life than if they really tried to compete with these, these big wigs on Wall Street. Not to say that they couldn't, but they, they didn't take care of all of these other efficiencies before taking that leap. Yeah, I think that is a good point. And the one comment you made about Alibaba and how 
some firms or their models would overreact to the statements, the earnings when they come out. That's so interesting to me because as the world, I think a large, lots of large institutions are moving more quant based if there is kind of that learning curve where things like that happens. And it, there is still opportunities then for investors to find when it doesn't make sense when they see those overreactions in the market because it was done by a model and not someone doing the analysis behind it. And so I think that's so fascinating. But I kind of want to talk about the main behavioral biases that investors can fall victim to. You mentioned one, overconfidence. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about the top mistakes in these biases that investors make and how does that impact investors' outcomes and returns? Yeah, so... The screaming one that always really bothers me is the overconfidence bias. It's prolific in young men, and it spawns from their biological need to mate, and they are strictly very, very overconfident. So fortunately, it doesn't happen nearly as often or as prolific in young self-identifying women. So that's a, a fortunate thing. It's actually better to be a young female investor than it is a young male. And part of it comes from trading. They just trade too much. They become overconfident. And so definitely if you're trading a lot, that is a sign, especially if you're a, a young man, I would say definitely look out for that from, from the aspect and realize you may not know as much as you think you do, and that's okay. But definitely try and consider what are different aspects that you can you can see. Well, how did I perform versus the S&P 500? Because I thought I knew something, but it turns out everyone else on Wall Street already knew that ahead of time. Another thing that I, I find a tremendous issue with older individuals, and I've taken a lot of flack for it recently because the market has gone down, is the under-participation in stocks. So while young men are overconfident in trading more and are more aggressive in their investing strategy, the other side is on average, people are very risk averse and they're not participating in stocks. Stock, or what I like to look at it more is, is business ownership is one of the best ways to grow your wealth over a long period of time. And as you're young, it's a fantastic way to grow your wealth. I personally am ecstatic that the market has, I wouldn't say ecstatic, I'm, dis I'm saddened for my uh, older clients and, and older investors who are five years before retirement and five years after, they have a tremendous amount of risk. But for these young people, this is a fantastic opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity, especially if you have the skills, especially if you've accumulated it to, to start saving because the market has gone down and while your portfolios have gone down, there's a huge opportunity to buy in at a lower amount and really focus on those, the next 20 years of returns, which will, will hopefully set you up for retirement. Another big concern, so definitely the overconfidence, specifically in younger men, the under participation in stocks, the hurting effect, I thought FTX was a huge aspect of the hurting effect, people investing into that. Uh, cryptocurrency as well. I think there's a lot of hurting effects. The GameStop, GameStop, I think there were some incredibly smart people who are exploiting a short squeeze. And then I think there were a tremendous amount of other people who were like, wow, I got to get in on this. And they were just focused on the hurting effect. They didn't even know what a short squeeze was, or perhaps they knew a little bit and maybe read a one article or, or, or two on it. So definitely look out for the hurting effect. I would say there's a a saying when someone gets shot in the neighborhood, buy a house, because home prices have probably just plummeted and the, the police are now more in that neighborhood and they're gonna be monitoring it more. Well, people are fleeing in fear. So Warren Buffett's saying, be, be uh, fearful when others are greedy and then be uh, greedy when others are fearful is a, definitely a good saying, but it's the opposite of what most people do. Most people are selling high and buying low and they're following everyone else. They're just following the herd. Another one is optimism bias. So there was a, I think it was Prudential. It was this kind of obscure commercial that no one really understood, I think, besides some of us, but it was with a Harvard psychologist and he had people put up 
uh, little sticky notes and they were green and red. And he said, in the past, tell us major life events that happened to you that were positive and negative. And perhaps it was the death of someone they loved. Perhaps it was a switching of a career or a job change that was a great decision. Maybe it was meeting their spouse, all of these things. And if you look at the historic perspective, there was a good mix of red and green. And then when they looked in the future aspect, there was way more green than red. There was a tremendous amount of green. And even the further out someone got, the more green there was. So people perhaps had some issue. It's like, well, I know there's gonna be this negative event that's coming, and I'm gonna put that up there. But there was a tremendous amount of green. And the further out, the more optimistic they became. That, that persists in our personal lives. It persists in the market. We are, we are overly optimistic about the future. There's some neurotic individuals, once you hit a certain level of neuroticism, you tend to look more pessimistic about the future. But for the most aspects of our life is where we are optimists and for most individuals. So that's an important thing to look out for. There are negative events that are coming and they will happen in your life and you need to be prepared for them and you need to be able to adapt to those situations. I would say one of the, the number one places that sell life insurance. Do you know who sells like one of the most life insurance here, at least in the United States? No. Oh. So funeral homes sell tremendous amounts of life insurance. Makes sense. So you're, you're no longer overly optimistic when you're at a funeral. And that oh kind of gets goodness. to the, the recency bias as well, which also persists in the market. We value the recent information a lot more. Uh oh, we're now pessimistic about the future. Oh my gosh, I don't have life insurance. Maybe sometimes it's a reality check, but then at other times we now went from this overly optimistic to this overly pessimistic uh, in, the, in the short term. That, that tends to wear off, but that's where a tremendous amount of life insurance is happening. It's a big one here in the United States, funeral homes selling uh, lots and lots of life insurance. That's so funny. And the one about the optimism that got me thinking, because as investors, one of the biases is it goes with kind of overconfidence. And when you're stock picking, if you're very optimistic about a company, you might over extrapolate their growth expectations, or you might justify paying a bit too high because you're just really excited about the company. And so that's why I think these things are just so fascinating to learn about, because once you're aware of it, you can keep yourself in check and hopefully use that to just be self-critical and say, are my, is my model actually realistic? Are my growth rates realistic? Am I being over-optimistic and certain things like that? So that was super interesting. Yeah. I, I always like to say Tesla is a screaming example. What they've been able to accomplish is nothing short of a miracle. I mean, it's just to build a car is difficult to enter a market where most automotive manufacturers make their money off of financing and then after car parts to be able to enter that market and then disrupt it and make those vehicles electric, which is incredibly hard. They've, they've managed to do nothing short of a miracle. I mean, it's just absolutely fantastic. They've accelerated all the other manufacturers to really get after it and create electric vehicles and change our, our admissions structure. And I think it's fantastic. But the evaluation that they had a couple of years ago was just like, oh my gosh, like I get it. They have to grow at a 50% revenue, a hundred percent revenue year over year. They have to, they 100% have to based on this evaluation after they've already accomplished all of these amazing things. And so, yeah, I mean, they, they were worth more than like all the other auto manufacturers combined. Yes, they deserve a premium, perhaps maybe a couple of auto manufacturers, but I don't know about all of them. So yeah, it's just kind of uh, an interesting act of over-optimism. Uh, I just thought another one was interesting was Zillow was completely getting into the buying of the homes market. And they kept saying that they wanted to be the, the start to end user. They wanted to help you with your bank loan. They want to do home inspections, everything. And I'm like, guys, you're going to disrupt all the big banks, all of these industries. It just seems like you're being overconfident and over optimistic and they got a crazy evaluation for it and they've completely dropped out of that. And I'm not saying Zillow is not a fantastic app, but it just seems like these companies and these managements go through these 
And the more that they seem more erratic, the higher these evaluations tend to be. And it's like, okay, well, we all hate oil because it's the omissions and all of these things, but then we all drive to work and do all of these other things. It's like, yeah, well, you kind of need these oil companies around. And I would love it if we could just turn the, the light switch off for, for all these oil companies and switch completely to clean energy, but it's not gonna happen overnight. And so just these various other things, obviously banks is another one. I think people have, the bank is coming for my house, they're coming for my house, we hate the banks. But at the end of the day, I don't think the bank wants your house. I think they want to charge you a high interest rate, but they don't want you to not be able to pay it off. They would rather just have the, the, the amount on the, the loan paid out. And so we kind of ostracize these different groups. And I, I don't want to say they're going to help perform, but I kind of think they will. And it's just because they've been beaten down and we're just too pessimistic about certain areas. And then we're too optimistic about other ones. And really there should be this this margin that we, we fall in for, for most companies. Mm -hmm. So you kind of talked about how behavioral biases can influence crazes like the run up in crypto or the tulip craze. And I'm wondering on the flip side of that, how it can also impact recessions and market downturns. Do investors then overreact on the downside as well? Definitely, definitely. There's typically... I wouldn't say always, but there's a lot of times an overcorrection. So you've gone from being way overvalued to now undervalued by how much is, is kind of a relative comparison. I think the 2008, we definitely saw a little, little period of quite a bit of undervalued securities that were going to come out of this and do incredibly well. And that's part of the run-up that we've experienced was we now went from an undervalued back to being overvalued again. But yeah, it's, it's typically the back to back, like you can make some really key decisions in your life and you can drastically outperform the market just because you were, you were buying in when things were looking so bad and then you were perhaps a little more cautious at the very top. And that's really, I think, where it boils down to, well, how do you measure that? I'd love to do that. I, I, how do I measure that? And I really think the Schiller PE ratio, so those who aren't familiar with the Schiller PE ratio, it examines the earnings over a 10-year period. And the 10 years is assuming that that is one economic cycle. And uh, there's a lot of things that have to be worked out throughout the earnings in a, an economic cycle. And um, over a 10-year period, if you have a low Schiller PE ratio, and you can actually look it up on his website, if you have a lower Schiller PE ratio, I would start tilting more towards stocks. And if there's a, a higher Schiller PE ratio, I perhaps would either start uh, hedging a little bit, maybe some, some uh, longer term put options if you want to stay invested, or perhaps taking a little bit money off the table and investing more in, in bonds and other securities. It's people I just have this huge aversion to cash because they love stocks and how fantastic they are, but also realize that there is a lot of value in having perhaps um, stocks or some type of tips. I was like, say, cash is still trash when you can buy tips and uh, I bonds. I, I don't like cash in the essence of that, but I, I do like the inflation adjusted version of cash <laughs> is, is a much more attractive. So I think it's Ray Dalio says that cash may not be trash anymore. I would say cash is still trash because you're losing your purchasing power. But if at least you're maintaining your purchasing power with tips or I bonds, then it's a definitely not trash. It's a more of a, a cushion going forward. It's so interesting thinking about the market over the past, I don't know, last six months or even year, how it didn't go down maybe as much as I expected at least. And so it leaves me wondering if, and I think this is largely expected by a lot of people in the financial community where we're going to see more earnings downgrades in the next couple quarters in 2023. And then I think the last time I looked at the Schiller CAPE ratio or Schiller P, it still was like it's come down, but it's still above the historically normal or average level. And so it is interesting because historically that has rang true. If you look at every time it's well over the average, it tends to come down. And so 
I mean, history, it's not guaranteed, but it's a pattern that sometimes can't be ignored. Definitely, definitely. I would not rule out that there is more pain to come because of that, in the sense that we definitely have a potential of more pain to come. It'll be interesting to see. I think a lot of evaluations in these major tech companies have come down quite a bit. A lot of restructuring has happened. We could have this soft landing. And I think if there's a soft landing, it's going to persist longer than people anticipate. I think the United States prefers more hard landing. We we tend to be more boom and bust than most places, whereas places perhaps like Japan would rather have a longer drawn out issue. But yeah, I I think we have a lot of macroeconomic issues that are happening. And then we do have some some various other micro issues. And just to have such a strong dollar is, is going to be difficult going forward. But I think it's still a great time to buy stocks. I, I think even if you are a young person and you, okay, say I'm, say I'm wrong, I'm completely wrong, and you just keep buying stocks and it drops another 20% and you're in your 30s and then it goes down 35% and you just keep buying and you just keep buying, you're going to come out of this pretty well because they're going to go back up and they're going to go up rather quickly. I would say one of the one of the big misconceptions about the stock market is the fact that things go up over time. Well, that's absolutely true. A lot of the times things tend to act very sporadically and they can happen almost overnight. It's very scary. The problem is like if you miss out on those few days where the market just shoots way up, your returns are going to be way lower. And if you could time that, that's fantastic. But the problem is it's so random and it's just like, what the heck is causing this spike in X stock to go up seven or 8% over the past week when it hasn't done anything for the past two years? Oh, now look, it's up 20% in the past month, whereas it hasn't gone up in the past five years. And it's kind of interesting that we do discuss about long-term investing, but a lot of things do happen overnight but then it's impossible to tell what those overnights are gonna be. So yeah, it's, it's a very interesting aspect, but the likelihood of you losing out of money over a 10 year period in the stock market, investing in US securities is, is relatively low if you have a very large diversified basket of stocks. And I'm not saying you have to go the full S&P 500, but if you have 10, 15, 20 securities over, over time, it, it's gonna definitely, uh, a solid chance of either being at the same level after 10 years or higher. And if you're buying at the lower rate, your your dollar cost averaging in based on when you get paid and you're putting it in, the likelihood that the, the stock is even up more, your, your portfolio is up, is even going to be greater. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting how you pointed out the January effect earlier and thinking about that now heading into January where I'm assuming there's going to be lots of people and big institutions um, capitalizing on the losses, but at the same time with the expectation of earnings revisions. And I think there's 50 basis points more of Fed hikes priced into the market right now. So with those expectations, it's just interesting to see maybe we could see another mini rally in the first month, but then who knows, like things could get worse. And so understanding these biases and anomalies again, are just so interesting because it could be a fake little rally. And then you can think that, oh, that might've just been the January effect. Yeah. Well, you bring up a, a fantastic point. There's three types of people that are, I would say, I want to pick on CNBC or Fox, uh, Fox news or anyone, but there's three types of people that are, that are going on there. And there's the one who says, we are going to enter a rally. We are done with this. We're heading for the next level. Then there's the other one. It's like, oh, we're going to hit a mild recession. Things are going to kind of stagnate. We've priced in the mild recession. Maybe we'll have a a little decline or maybe a little upside, but then we're going to come out of this and we're going to do fantastic. And then there's the other person who's the doomsday person. And it's like, oh my gosh, we're going to go down another 30, 40%. And... (laughs) I always laugh because they've hedged their bets. No matter what happens, they have someone who can come on and say, I was right. They have someone who can come on and say, I was right. And 
they make a good story. Always the pessimist always gets the most news because we are risk averse. So when, if I went on and said there's 30% market decline, I would be trending more than the other two. But one when I'm wrong, it would be the other two and it would be the, the one who's right. And if you get enough people and they get two predictions right, it's like, oh, this is our guru type scenario. It's like, well, they got, they, they got lucky twice. There was a, I don't wanna, don't wanna say the fund, but there was these funds and they would have like 25, 50 different funds. And then as the funds did underperformed, they would start rolling them into other funds. And the highest performing ones would do, do the best. And they would just keep having those. And those are the ones that got advertised to. And those were the ones that would flow in the assets and they would just absorb these, these underperforming funds. Well, these highest performing funds over the past 10, 15 years would actually underperform because they were sector tilted or, or whatever. Um, and the reversal came, the reverse came. So then the ones, oh, we need to introduce a commodities fund because commodities are booming. And the commodities fund will do okay for a little while and maybe it starts absorbing these other funds. And so it was just this huge prolific thing. I always like to say uh, Jordan Belford. Jordan Belford, the, the Wall, Wolf of Wall Street Ponzi scheme guy, is he would pick various stocks and he would get you, if you had 100 people and the stock market actually during the time period he was doing it, there was a lot of upside. So you could have thrown a dart at the board and you, you could have picked a winner. And it was so, it looked really good. Now, right now, I would say if you, you threw a dart at the board, you probably got a loser. <laughs> it's probably gone down over the past six months here. You probably caught a loser. Maybe, maybe it's performed. But during the time period that he did it, there was a lot of winners. So if he had 100 people and picked 100 different stocks, it seemed like 80% of them were winners. And it just was like fantastic. And it says, oh, I picked a blue chip winner for this rich person. And then he would find the ones that won the most. And in a period where the market's just going up quite rapidly, you probably have a 30% winners. And then if you do it again, and then you have a 15% of those winners win again. Now, if you call me up, you have made me so much money and I am so happy with, with, with George Belford or one of his team members. And now he pitches this company I've never heard of. These were all blue chip stocks before. And now he pitches me something that I've never heard of. Oh my gosh, this is a huge opportunity for me. And then I don't look at the commission rates because the commission rates for someone who's made me so much money, I don't care as much. And that's where they made all of their money was those 15% or the, the 10, maybe it was eight, 9% on those commission rates that went through the roof on the people that they had gotten right twice. And of course they were absolutely bogus. And then the amount of money I'm willing to invest with this person who's, a, who's picking these winners. And that's really human nature. If I have a track record of success, you probably think I'm gonna to continue to be successful before in the future. Yeah, that is so interesting. I know I just had a chat with Larry Swedro a little while ago and he taught, he writes about that so much where it relates to fund managers and assessing your own performance where people go with the fund manager based on their past performance, but there's no evidence. Typically those that perform good in the past, they don't continue to perform well. And so it's really interesting understanding those things. And then on the recency bias, so you talked about that and I just want to bring that in the context text of today and for our listeners and how I guess the challenges with maybe a lot of people did super well with their stock picks in their portfolio over over the past decade over past few years and can you talk a little bit then about how recency bias plays in and what might be some challenges that they face now investing in this new decade yeah so I think we are going through a paradigm shift so we, we focus on this high flying tech evaluation, change the world type aspect. And it was cheap money, cheap money from the, the federal government printing money, but then also from the aspect of just really low interest rates. Kudos to everyone who locked in during the pandemic for home prices spiked at a 30 year 2.8% mortgage. I am so jealous of you, congratulations. I don't think we're gonna see that for, I don't know, ever. It may not happen. 
I'll probably old, have a lot of gray hair next time it happens, but we probably won't see this persistent mortgage rate of, of seven, eight percent forever. But I don't think we're going to see 2.8 for a very long time. So we are entering a paradigm shift. So that's one thing to realize is there is a major shift coming that is in the process. The other aspect of it is the past year has been rough all around for a lot of different groups, whether you're in bonds, whether you're in stocks, but there will be opportunity and it's a good time now. I, I know you may have thought you were overconfident in your stock picking ability and you perhaps now you took on way too much risk and it worked out. Now it's time to, to reevaluate and say, okay, perhaps I don't know as much as I thought I knew and perhaps becoming more of a passive based investor is, is more for me. I don't have the time to dedicate to this, but I can focus on increasing my, my income elsewhere and try and increase my ability to invest. I would say that retirees have accumulated one eighth of the world's wealth and most millionaires have been made in their 401ks in their, their 403b plans, all of these retirement based assets that they've been extremely efficient in and they saw the opportunity and it just, it takes, it takes quite a while, but it's always difficult because we always idolize the person who won. So right now the people who are overly pessimistic and have now made a bunch of money betting on pessimism, we, we've looked at them and like, wow, they're so smart. They're, they're geniuses. And then the people who were high flying the Kathy Woods and, and the ARK investments, Wow, she is, she is an absolute genius. The reality is the pessimist has merit. There is merits from being a pessimist. And then also, I think Kathy Woods has some fantastic points of various things that she said, but um, they're, they're not overly genius on, on both aspects. I think they're more human than you originally thought. And I think um, people need to be aware that they are more human and stock picking is a very difficult, it's a very difficult game. And the problem with it is the recent events are not indicative of what your 10 year average is going to be. So whether you're way up in the past year or two years is not indicative of what you're going to be in 10 years. And in 10 years, if let's say you're, you're 35 now in 10 years, you're 45 and now situations have gotten a lot different. Your, your personal situation has changed dramatically. So understanding your limitations and really looking at understanding your limitations is, is very, very important, especially if you're a, a young male. Realizing that you do have limitations, you are not a stock picking guru, or you're not a complete idiot if you've invested in these various things and things have fallen apart. If things have fallen apart, it's perhaps time to, to reevaluate and realize that you can lean into this and, and double in on investing in stocks and various other assets. Um, and then the other aspect is if you have one and you're, you've been a big winner as of late, realizing that you are still human, don't let it go to your head. Things, things happen. Um, you, you, there's a lot of randomness. Our minds don't perceive randomness very well. We like to create a story for everything. And I don't think there was hardly anyone that perceived a COVID-19 pandemic. It's like, well, if we don't model in randomness, I don't know how many people in the fund managers or elsewhere were like, we have to be very concerned about a global pandemic. I, I, I would love to have met the guy who was like, I'm very concerned about a global pandemic. I'm going to start hedging my portfolio because of that. I just, it, it just doesn't seem the government, everything is, is was blindsided. So you have to assume that there's a lot of things that are going to happen that we just are not, we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> so it's the unknown unknowns of the world. Yeah, that's so interesting that you pointed that out. And the power of narratives, 
I loved looking into that during the pandemic, because if you look back on history, it's every significant downturn had a really horrendous narrative attached to it. And at every points in those times, I bet everyone was thinking the same thing. This is this time is different. And this is the worst thing they've ever experienced in their relative lifetime and in their experiences. And so it's just interesting how we can look back on history and see just the power of narratives and how it can really swing those overreactions and perhaps underreactions at times as well. 100%. And I would also add to that is we create a narrative about super successful people. We create this narrative about just, oh man, what was I thinking? Why didn't I get onto that train? That, that person's an absolute genius. We don't value luck. So I would say Netflix is the prime example. I don't think Netflix should exist. I personally don't think Netflix should be around at all. And the narrative behind it is, if you look back at it, Blockbuster should have adopted the model. They should have adopted the model that Netflix had. They could have, you could have physically gone into the store, dropped off your movie, picked up another one. They were unwilling to adopt and change their model. And they had distribution, they had everything better. And they actually almost caught up. Carl Icahn bought massive, massive swaths of the stock and was planning on catching up to Netflix. And the, the problem was that the economic downturn of the 2008 financial crisis, Blockbuster had more debt, they couldn't service all of this debt, they couldn't get on the train of innovation, but they really, there was multiple steps that Blockbuster could have done to absolutely prevent this from happening and prevent this like massive thing. But we always look at it and it's like, oh my gosh, Netflix was a genius. We, we should have got on the Netflix train forever ago. But we don't look at the failures and the stock market is that. We have a very survivorship bias in the stock market. It's like, oh my gosh, that guy in the garage, why did we not see this coming? And it's like, you're right, you didn't see it coming, but so did the massive incumbent that was there they didn't see it coming either. And they got really complacent. And that's why they, the complacency at this other company, I would say almost had just as much of an effect. I think Walmart, Walmart, I think could have adopted a very Amazon based model and could have sown massive amounts of success. eBay perhaps could have been way more successful than it currently is if they had adopted some type of model. It just seems like Amazon came just screaming through and I just thought there was going to be more competitors for their, their market share, but it really, it was like Amazon delivered. Walmart had in physical locations, they had everything. And I, I, I'm just curious. And we always like to, you, you're either a, a hero as a company and then you, you stay around long enough to become the enemy. And I think that's happening with Amazon is they were the hero for a long time. And now they've slowly become this, this enemy company of this big uh, conglomerate type, type scenario that, that Walmart went through way back in the day. But we really value these massively successful people. In hindsight, we always look back, it's like FTX. It's like, oh gosh, that was, what were we thinking? But when we praise someone, it's like, oh my gosh, we didn't really value the, the, the randomness uh, that, that really takes place. The, the prime example is I've met someone who's won the lottery. So they won the lottery. Fantastic. Not as much as you think, but it was a good amount of money. It was like, like $5 million plus. Fantastic. So happy for the person. You won the lottery. Congratulations. You got incredibly lucky. There was no skill involved with that. Most people can see that that person got lucky. Most people can see that there was a complete randomness. But the, the guy who bought up the, the swaths of farmland in Illinois that now is going under real estate development and has gone up 20 fold in value over the past 10 years. Oh, he was so smart. That was, that was such a skill play. And then the other aspect of it is people like to brag. They don't like to tell you about their losers. I would say, if you want to, you want to talk to an individual investor and immediately they start talking about all of their winners, I'm assuming they're probably not a good investor, but if someone's like, Oh, I was an idiot. I bought in at X and it went down to, to, to why, and it's just done nothing but tank, and here's my five losers, but I'm doing really successful because I have a tremendous amount of winners, is the, the other side. So we either like to take the extreme approach of either belittling someone for a situation that perhaps a lot of it was out of their control, 
or we like to just say, oh, wow, this entrepreneur is an absolute genius. They're so smart. They saw this coming. And at some point, if you look back and you're like, yeah, I don't think they saw that coming. There was a tremendous amount of luck in the, the, the aspect of what actually happened. <laughs> it's so interesting because everything seems obvious in hindsight and we can look back and really it's only then when we look back and you realize that you made a mistake by following the herd or you have you wish that you got in earlier. But I think that was such a great way to end today's episode. That was such a great reminder for us all and the power of randomness, too. I think that is such a good reminder. But before I let you go today, where can the audience go to connect with you and learn more about you and your work? Yeah, so right now I'm at NYU. So you can go on to NYU. If you just Google NYU Masters in Financial Planning, you can connect with. We've got a LinkedIn page there. You can follow everything that we'll come up with, uh, any research or anything that I come out with. You'll, you'll see it on their website, but then you'll also see it the, the general social media type elements. I, don't, I wouldn't say I'm, a, I'm not on TikTok or, or Instagram or anything, but you can follow the, the LinkedIn page if you want to just kind of get a general update or you can follow the, the NYU's website. We have a tremendous amount of information and we're very excited. We, we've seen a lot of success in the New York metropolitan area with the launch of the program. Yeah, we're, we're hoping to continue to grow the, the masters in financial planning and serve the primarily, I would say, it's millennials serving the boomers. So if you're interested in financial planning, a lot of it is serving the, the boomers. But as they continue to age, a lot of them, fortunately, millennials, if you have wealthier parents, there's going to be a massive transition of wealth to the millennial generation. It has already started, but it's just going to get more and more, especially if also if you're in the non-for-profit field, there's going to be massive amounts of funding coming your, their way. There's a, a lot of wealth tied up in these 401k, 403bs, and there's going to be a lot of direct donations. And then also for uh, millennials, they're going to have a, hopefully a nice inheritance coming here <laughs> in the next yeah. 20 years on average. That is such a good point you bring up. I actually had another guest bring up that point, that historic wealth transfer that's going to happen, which is just super interesting to think about the implications that will have for millennials. And like you mentioned, so many other organizations as well. But I want to thank you again so much for coming on today, Colin. This was great. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you establish goals to help you realize the importance of the money and why you're accumulating, and then you establish rules that help you eliminate unnecessary mistakes, I think you're going to start to see a lot more success.